and welcome to Ignite with Mwangala. With me, Mwangala Chakalashi Santos. Now remember, the aim of the show is to bring you real people with real stories that are meant to leave a lasting and positive impact on your lives. Our guest for this show is the first Zambian trained at degree level in real estate management. He is the executive chairperson and the principal consultant of CMM Property Group, Mr. Christopher Mwenya Mulenga. Mr. Mulenga, welcome to Ignite with Mwangala. Thank you very much, Mwangala. I'm so happy to finally have you on this show. I know you should have come some time back, but I think this is the right time. I think so too. Uh, let's talk about Christopher Mulenga. Take us back to the days when you started, or rather take us back to your early days. What was that like for you? Well, my early days, I, I think I'll, let me start off with uh, my family. I'm uh, the third born son. I'm the eldest son, but third born in a family of five. My father was the late, is the late, is late now, Mr. Safeli Mulenga. He used to be an educationist. My mother, Magdalene Lombe Yvonne Mulenga, also an educationist. In fact, her last job was that of curriculum development expert. She's retired. She's still alive. So um, I grew up, I was born in Chalimbana. My father was a teacher at Chalimbana teacher, teacher Training College. I was born in 1958. So my early days were, were there. And then when my parents, after independence, were sponsored to go and train in England, uh, my father went to Scotland, uh, Jordan Hill College in Glasgow. My mother trained home economics, city and guilds in Leeds. Now the two years while, when they were away, we lived in a township called Chifubu. If you know Ndola. I was in Ndola. So for two years I was in Chifubu with my grandmother, with, the, with my siblings. And those were very interesting days, but that's a story for another day. Mm. You know, but um, from there, when my parents came back from England, we moved to Luansha, where they, 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 they got jobs. And I started my primary school at a fee-paying school called Harrison, or rather continued, because I'd already done sub A and sub B at what they called vernacular schools in, in, in Chifu, St. Bonaventure. That was my first school, where I did sub A and sub B. And surprisingly enough, what I learned in sub A and sub B was enough to learn how to read Bemba. Well, how the, old were you when, when you were doing sub A and sub B? I think I must have been about seven, seven, eight years old. They taught you R-A-E-O-U. Mame, Mimo, Mutate, Tito, Tu. So you, they walked you through all those vowels and then you learned how to read Bemba. So just sub A and sub B, I learned how to read Bemba. Then when my parents came, we were taken to a fee-paying school called the Harrison Primary School in Luansha. <clears throat> now, it was a very different change. You've been learning in vernacular languages. Mm -hmm. Now you're taken to a fee-paying school and you're, you're one of the few black pupils there. There was a bit of rejection from the, 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 the white kids. They didn't like blacks now beginning to enter their space, so they thought. What's happening now? <laughs> so the, what's happening now, these black people? So we were, we were not well received initially. But eventually, because of my sporting, I was good at athletics, I was good at rugby, soccer, cricket. Because I was outstanding, these white kids wanted me to be on their team when you take sides. So that's when now I, I started gaining acceptance. And then of course, by the time we got to, to grade six, where I'd already excelled into the A stream and I was more conversant learning in English and talking English. 
And in fact, notably, in grade six, there were only four black African pupils. There was uh, one girl, a very, very intelligent girl, one, Judith Chirwa. Mm, I remember, remember her name. <laughs> yeah, I remember her, very intelligent. She's, uh, she's a businesswoman now. And then there were three other, the three of us, myself, and then there was Mabin Simfukwe. Mabin is a specialist medi medical doctor in, 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 in the States, is in uh, Texas. And then Richard Nkata is a principal at a um, school in Chilabombwe, a private school. So those, we were in the A stream. We ended up becoming the first few prefects, African prefects. So from there, I, we, my parents got transferred, my father got transferred to Lusaka. So I came to, for my later part of the grade seven, I finished grade seven at Woodlands. From there, I got selected to go to David Kaunda Secondary Technical School. Now, the, the interesting thing is my father had gone, had studied at Hodgson Technical College with the same premises. So before I, st I start for my grade seven, he took me and my brother to the school and he told me and my brother, this is a school I want you to come to for your Form 1. But the, the, the special thing about the school, you could not apply to go there. You had to be selected by outstanding scores. Mm, it was on merit. It was on merit. Mm. So fortunate enough, I studied hard. I got selected and went to David Kaunda. I eventually became vice school captain there. My brother also got selected. He went to David Kaunda. And even he became vice school captain. In fact, he's my partner in the business now. I'll talk about him later. Mm. And um, from there, I'm, I'm, I managed to get a, a Division I at uh, Cambridge All Levels. That time was sitting for Cambridge um, General Certificate of Education. Uh, examinations from the uh, set in the UK. I got a division one. I got accepted to go to University of Zambia. We were supposed to be the first INTEG to study architecture. So I was accepted to go and study architecture at um, University of Zambia. Now, somewhere along the way, before that course started, I saw an advert in the newspaper. There were two Commonwealth scholarships being advertised for pupils to go and for interviews and to be selected to go and study at the University of Nigeria. Now, out of interest, I just applied and I got invited for the interview. Now, before the interview, I didn't know what this degree, Bachelor of Science degree in estate management was all about. So before going for the interview, I went to this in, uh, encyclopedia at my mom's house. We, this encyclopedia is still there. Uh -huh. So I picked the encyclopedia, looked up what estate management was all about. Oh, it's about land and buildings. Then I knew I was ready for the interview. So I went for the interview. The first question they asked me, there was a, uh, an expatriate um, gentleman, a European gentleman on the panel. The first question he asked, what do you understand by the term estate management? And my answer was simply, this estate management has something to do with land and buildings. That's all you could remember. <laughs> that was all that was required. Uh. That gentleman exclaimed, he said, finally, we have somebody who knows what this thing is all about? Then I knew I was selected. And when the results came out, I was selected. But then I turned them down. I, I told them I've been selected to go to the University of Zambia, and that's my preferred course of study was architecture. So I turned them down. University of Zambia opened. I went to the University of Zambia. 
We got our jackpot, you know, the best rig they paid us. They set up, the, those days, I don't know if they do it now, they, they used to hold freshman's ball. They would, they would hire a band. In that year, they hired a band from Kitwe called Peace. Mm -hmm. So they did a, a, a concert at the Goma Lakes. When it was time to register for architecture, they failed to find lecturers. So now I was in a dilemma. Architecture wasn't going to start. Then they started suggesting things like, oh, you could do a degree in engineering. I said, no, I don't want to be an engineer. Then they said, you could do a, a plain Bachelor of Science degree if you want, none quarter. I said, no. What, where would that take me? Then they suggested, OK, why don't you do town planning? So the town planning was near to environmental studies. So I opted for town planning. So I start lectures, bought the books, started lectures. So one day, I'm going to my room in what we call the ruins. You know the old hostels were called the ruins. Mm, mm. <laughs> President 1, room 17 was my room. So I go to my pigeonhole where we gave you mail. I find there's a letter in my pigeonhole. It's from the Bursary Committee. Mr. Mulenga, report to the Bursary Committee urgently. So I went there. You know the news they had for me, Mwangala? They told me that, look, I, I had to, they were requesting me to reconsider my decision and go take up that Commonwealth Scholarship and, and study estate management, which is a real estate degree, and become the first Zambian to be trained at degree level. In Nigeria? To be in Nigeria. Now, as I told them, I said, look, to make up my decision, I, I need to check with my, my father. So I went to my father. I said, what I'm doing at the University of Zambia, I'm not in this opportunity I've been selected for, for this common scholarship, I think is a better option. But I have to study in Nigeria. Then my father asked me, which part of Nigeria are you going to? I said, I'm going to Anambra State, which is the former Biafra amongst the Igbos. Now, that was very significant at the time because Zambia, when Nigeria had a civil war between the Igbos and the rest of the country, Dr. Kaunda and Zambia sided with Biafra, the place I'm going to. So we were funding that civil war, mm. sending them Salaula, and they had never forgotten that. So it was Event like home for you. Yeah, so, so my father said, if it was any other part of Nigeria, I wasn't going to allow you. But since it's Biafra, you're going to the Igbos, Igbo land. And we sided with them. You're going to be welcome. That's how he allowed me to go. And within a week, I was, uh, I was in Nigeria. Brilliant. I want you to hold that thought. When we come back, I'd like you to talk about your university days in Nigeria. We take a short break. When we come back, we continue talking to Mr. Christopher Mulenga. Don't go away. May we use these trying moments to rise to something that's important. Take life not for granted. Tell someone that you love them. If any of you have any COVID-19 symptoms, which are a fever of above 38 degrees Celsius, a cough, difficulty in breathing, shortness of breath, or chest pains, please do not hesitate to call 909 or 0974-493553 and medical assistance will come your way. We hope for the better and leave everything in the hands of God. Together, we can combat COVID-19. Please stay at home for me. I stayed at work for you. Be the change. Please do your best to stay at home. If you must leave your home, please remember to mask up. Keep social distancing of at least one meter and wash your hands often with soap and running water or any alcohol-based hand sanitizer. 
Welcome back. If you're joining us now, I'm talking to Mr. Christopher Malenga, who is the executive chairperson of CMM Property Group. Now, before we went on break, you talked about going to Nigeria for your university. What was that like? It was very, very interesting. We arrived in Nigeria, and the first thing that hit us was the weather. It's very humid there. And uh, the, the, the people at the embassy received us well, and they put us on a coach to go to uh, Enugu. Lagos to Enugu was about about six hours or so uh, drive. And um, it was very, very interesting. We reached a town called Onisha. Then we're now very hungry. And at Onisha, the, the coach stopped for us to take some, um, some food. There were hawkers selling food. The first one who came, they were selling snail. So we can't eat snail. Mm. There was two of us, Matthew Chilinda was the other Zambian I went to school with in Nigeria. He said, we can't eat snails, we don't eat snails. So then a, a lady came with, with um, sausage rolls. They said, aha, uh -huh, let's buy the sausage rolls. So we bought two packets, one for myself, one for Matthew. He bought it for himself as well. Just as the bus was starting off, we found out that that bread roll had a sausage roll, uh, had a meatball this side and a meatball this side. In the middle, there was no sausage roll. <laughs> so you can t imagine you take a bite and then you find it just bread. And then we look at the person, the person is just waving at us. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, we knew we had been hard. We put, they put the first one on us. That was welcome that was to you in Nigeria. Welcome to Nigeria. <laughs> you have to be careful. Very interesting place. So anyway, we arrived at the university. We were very well received. It turned out it was the top Igbo university, the only top Igbo university. All Igbos don't want to go to any other university except that one. So we were relatively younger than the others because the others would attempt four, five times until they get in. They don't want to go to another university. There are many universities in Nigeria, University of Lagos, Amadibelo, and so on, Port Harcourt. But the Igbos just want to get into that because once you get a degree from the University of Nigeria and Suka, then we belong to a, it's like the Harvard, if you know the equivalent of those Ivy League schools in America. Mm. It's like it's a Harvard of university in Nigeria. In fact, the, the late Chinua Achebe, we found him there. He was a research fellow at the main campus in the English department. You know the, the gentleman who wrote books like Things, Things Fall, Fall Apart, Apart, No Longer mm. at Ease? Mm. Yeah, we found him there. And uh, it was a, a very good university. Now, the problem started We never received our money on time from the Commonwealth. It was a very lavish scholarship, but the money we never received on time. We would go to the bursar to find out if the money has come. The bursar would say, the money, your money hasn't come. We would write to the Commonwealth, they said, we've sent the money. We go to the bursar, the money hasn't come. So now we started a hand-to-mouth arrangement. Our money finished. We went to our head of department, Professor Ome, because he was proud that his department was now becoming international, attracting international students. He loaned us some money to keep us going. It was only at the end of the year, can you imagine the whole year we struggled? That's when the Bursa said, your money is in. You know what he had done? Mm -hmm. He took our scholarship money. It was $5,000 for me, $5,000 for Matthew, $10,000. He took that money and was trading with it. He was doing business with our money. So in the, at the end of the year, that's when he gave us the money. And when was this $5,000? Sounds like a lot of money. It was a lot of money. Then. We, we mm. were driving, we had cars. We, 
we had, our holidays were spending in the UK. In fact, we went to the UK that summer, summer 70, 78. We went straight to the Commonwealth and told them, don't ever send our scholarship money to that university. Send to the embassy oh. in Lagos. So the, that's when they said, that's what they did the following year. Now, the interesting thing is the person, he's waiting for our money mm. so that he can do what he did previously. Yeah. The money is not coming. Meanwhile, we had already collected the money from the embassy because the Commonwealth were sending it on time. Then the bursa summons us. These people haven't sent the money. You must write to them. Then we play him as well. So, but you know they send the money at the end of the year. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we so told him. It it's the normal. The They'll send at the end. No, no, no. It's not acceptable. I said, no, it is acceptable. <laughs> That's, That's how they do it. He was disgusted with us. We played him. <laughs> And eventually you got to finding out that that money will never pass through there. Yeah. So that's how we settled down there. Now let's talk about CMM, a company that has now been in existence for 35 yeah. years. How has that journey been for you? Very interesting again. Ah. You know, when, when we came back, okay, before coming back to Zambia, one of the lecturers had told me, when you graduate, I'll make you an offer to work for my company, an offer which you won't refuse. I said, we'll see about that. And true to his word, he gave me an offer that was irresistible. He offered me a job as an expatriate on expatriate condition to be paid in hard currency. He offered me a company car, a brand new 504 air conditioned vehicles. Like we in Zambia were assembling um, Fiat's. They were assembling 504's, Peugeot's. But then I said, the, the obedient son I was, I, sa I said to him, I said, look, let me just check with my mother. Because I used to uh, exchange a lot of letters with my mother. Let me check with my mother if I can take up this job. So I write to my mother and, and tell her that I've been offered this job. It's a two-year contract. After I get my graduate, I'll come home. But that wasn't the plan. The plan with all my friends were planned that when we graduate, we'll go to America. <laughs> How old were you? <laughs> this was just about, about 20, uh. 20, 21, there about when I graduated. So we, we had planned with all my friends, my Nigerian friends, we're going to hustle it out in America. Africa is not ready for business. Because that time there were socialist policies, there were, there were civil wars, there were liberation struggles. Business at the time in, the, in, in 1981 when I graduated wasn't really happening. Mm. So, but I never told my mother that after that contract, that was going to be my gratuity, was going to be seed money to take me to America. I just simply told her, I'll just do this two year contract and come home. My mother sent me a one sentence letter. Dear son, you are not taking up that job and you are coming home now. Love, mom. <laughs> <laughs> so when I, told, when I told Mark Odo, I said, Mark, my mother has missed me. She's, she's told me not to take up the job. To take up the job. Then, he, then Mark Old reacts. Obviously, he's disappointed. He wanted me to work for his company. He says, that's just a woman talking. He says, what? Mark, that's my mother. She's no ordinary woman. That is my mother. But to strike a compromise with Mark Odu, I told him, I said, well, she just basically wants to see me. I've been away for four years. When I go home after a year or two, mm. I can come back and join you. That's the compromise we struck up. So I come back to Zambia, the first Zambian trained at degree level. The first point of call for a job was supposed to be that government valuation department. 
It's the government who facilitated those, con those scholarships. They came through the um, bursaries committee. So we thought, ah, since they only have mostly expatriates working in the government valuation department, mm -hmm. they might want, now that they've got Zambians trained at degree level, we might get jobs. Mangala, when we got there, when I got there, because Matthew got a job with National Housing Authority, when I got there, they said, what qualification do you have? The guy was interviewing me. I told him, I've got a degree in estate management. Now, they didn't understand that estate management was just a real estate degree. Mm. When he had management, he chased me. You are too young. You, you want to be a manager here. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. I'll just be working in the valuation department. No, no, no. Chased. I couldn't get that job. So now I'm shocked. In Nigeria, I'm, where they have many graduates, I got that expatriate job. Now I come here, I'm struggling to find a job. Then I said, ah, I'll go to the building society because I'd done a stint with them one holiday. They had two Sri Lankan diploma holders as valuers, expatriates. So now me going there with a degree, I thought, ah, I'll maybe get I'll get it in easy. The gentleman who was heading the real estate department was a Zambian, but not a valuer, not a trained valuer. He was a quantity surveyor. But because of Zambianization, that was the closest qualification to valuation. So they made him head of the, the real estate department. So I went to him, I said, why don't you offer me a job? No, 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 we've got uh, these expatriate values. I said, I know, but you see, I'll cost you less because I'll be on local conditions of service. And those are diploma orders, I've got a degree. You know what he told me? Mm. These are so experienced, we can't let them go. Again, I couldn't get a job there. For the second time? Second time. I said, what's going on here? Can you imagine the first graduate in this field? Then I went to, to see Mr. S.P. Mulenga, Mr. Sunny Paul Mulenga. He was the first Zambian to, to qualify as a valuer. He had one of these uh, British professional diplomas. And he, was, he had been president of the Surveyors Institute of Zambia. I merely went to find out my eligibility to join the professional body, the Surveyors Institute of Zambia. So I got to his office. He had a three-room office in Electra House. Then he, the secretary ushered me into his office. Then he asked me, what qualification do you have? I said, I've got a Bachelor of Science degree in estate management. His, his response was, you are lying. Nobody in this country has that qualification. I said, well, we're the first one. In fact, there's two of us. One of my friends is, is Matthew Chilinda, and Matthew Chilinda and I are the first Zambians trained at degree level in this field. Then he asked me, do you have any proof? I had my statement of result, because my degree certificate hadn't come out, and I showed him. He just he read, can you start working for me tomorrow? I said, uh-huh. Finally, I found somebody who knows the qualification I have. That's how I started working the following day for SP Mulenga Associates. And that gentleman, hats off to him. He knew exactly what my qualification was and he gave me the opportunity to fit into his practice. And he made sure that wherever I went, I never ran out of cards. And my cards were showing clearly that I had a degree, because mm. he also wanted to show people that he was now employing university graduates. <laughs> so we're both benefiting. I'm being marketed He's yeah. marketing his business. Yeah. So we grew the company. The company grew so rapidly 
became the biggest practice. But the sad thing for me, the turning point, Remember, I'm only here to stay for a year or two, then I'll go to America to join my Nigerian friends. They're still there. I've, I've, I see them when I go there. Some are millionaires in US dollars. Some are well off, because I mean, they've been work, we've been working for 40 years. Mm. So obviously. Long time. So long time. So anyway, this gentleman gave me the opportunity to market his practice. Even the expansion, he allowed me to employ people, to hold interviews, employ people. Even when there was an op opening, I told him, I suggested to him, with that company, we didn't have an office in, in, um, in Livingston. I suggested to him, why don't we open up an office in Livingston? Then he says, ah, no, there's no money for that expansion. So I said, okay, why don't I go with my 127? Because the car now, I, I started off here with a seven-year-old 127. Can you imagine from, a, from a brand new Peugeot air condition? Four. Now I'm, I, was, I was driving what they call the shopping basket. Seven years old, but it was well-maintained, Mangala. That mm. went places. Yeah, I even went with it to Harare once. Wow. You know. Is it an equivalent to a Vitz now? I, I, I would say so, yeah. <laughs> the way the Vitz are, yeah. 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 So anyway, I, I went and opened up an office there. I, I, I convinced him that let me just go with my car and my desk. He says, okay, go. So I arrived in Livingston, set up the business. And uh, six months later, when he came to check on it, he found money. I'd made money. Because we're the only ones then. The very same opportunity I was telling him about. So anyway, sadly, mm. just after one year of working, my father died in a car crash. Now that's where the turning point came. Mm. My father had told me, as the eldest son, one day, one day when I'm gone and I'm dead, you're going to look after the family, extended family. You're going to look after everybody. Wow. So now, I didn't think you would go so early. That was being inculcated in me over the years. You were being prepared yeah, for, yeah. for that time. So when now, he, I want to hold that thought, mm -hmm. Mr. Mlenga. When we come back, you've talked about family. So when we come back, I would like you to talk about family. I know we've not talked about uh, CMM, uh, how that journey has been, yeah. where you are now. So when we come back, we talk about family and how CMM company has been for the last 35 okay. years. Don't go away. When we come back, we continue talking to Mr. Christopher Mlenga. As frontliners in the battlefield, we choose to rise above COVID-19. Yes, we choose to fight and to rise above discrimination and not to succumb to fear. We are now alert and together as one, we are ready to raise our strides of hope. Death might be knocking at the front door, but no mountain is too high, no river too wide, no storm too fierce. Our pain will strengthen us. Fear will drive our faith. Tiende pamozi na mtima umozi. Atuende antomwe amoyomwe. I stayed at work for you. Stay at home for me and be safe. Be that change. Please, do your best to stay at home. If you must leave your home, please remember to mask up. Keep social distancing of at least one meter and wash your hands often with soap and running water or any alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Welcome back. If you're joining us now, I am talking to Mr. Christopher Mulenga, who is the CMM executive and proprietor of CMM Property Group. Now, you go to Livingstone, you set up that business for Mr. S.P. Mulenga, you make a lot of money. What happens next? What happened next is um, because my father died, my father died tragically in a car crash in 1982, 9th May, 1982. And um, I'd just been working for a year. And then he had prepared, my father had prepared me psychologically to take responsibility when he passes on. Like I said earlier, I didn't think he would go so soon. 
But what that did for me, all my plans of joining my friends in America were now shelved because of the responsibility he had given me to do. So now I had to make it here. In 1985, I decided to set up CMM Property Consultants. In fact, it was called CM Mulenga Property Consultants. But because of there was SP Mulenga, there was a confusion between the two. So I had to abbreviate mine to CMM. Now, it was interesting. When I started the business, when I set up my company, I was 26 years old. I, was, I wasn't even married, but I had a fiancé, the same lady I eventually married. So I started marketing myself. And what was striking about the business environment at the time, 80 to 90% of the businesses were government-owned. They were parastatals. So it was very rare to find a young person owning a business in the private sector. Because the good jobs were in parastatals. That's where you got company cars, houses with swimming pools, and so on if you're a senior. You know. So when I set up my company, and I started marketing, trying to get business, they said, but you're too young to own a business. You're not even married. I said, but, but I've got a fiancé. They said, it's not the same. You're not married. Mm. So what did I do? I quickly married. So you married because of the business? No, no, no. I was in love of... also. <laughs> I like that. But then the business also had to, had to fulfill the, okay. had to have the correct image to do business. And since I'd already found somebody I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, mm. I decided I might as well marry her. Because my father, before, my father was, was a very, very strict dad. When I came back from university, that phone at home was ringing. All these girls were calling me. Mwangala I used to be good looking once upon a time. So they, they were calling me. So my father said, no, this is not acceptable. You can't have many girls call you. You have to find one. And then he said to me, I've got a friend of mine in Mansa. He's got beautiful daughters, I think. We can arrange one. I said, no, no, dad. <laughs> you wanted to find I, I find on my own. So we strike a deal. I, he lends me his car every weekend so that I can go to parties. And he's now the one grounded. Uh, Friday, Saturdays, it's my turn. To go and find your queen. So finally, <laughs> I met this lady. He had actually given me three months to find a, a wife to marry. I didn't have to marry her, just to find somebody I would eventually marry. Then I negotiated with him, no, 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 three months is too short. Then he extended it to six months. So I had six months. So when I met my, 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 my uh, when I met my wife, Doreen, you know, she was at the university. The introduction was very dramatic and simple. <laughs> Because my friend, she came highly recommended by a friend, my best friend, Evans Makosa. So I said, where is her room? This girl you are talking about. He told me, he said, you're wasting your time. She'll turn you down. She's turning down everybody. I said, aha, uh -huh, that's the one I want. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, eventually, so I went to her room and knocked on the door. And she answered. I didn't know it was her. I didn't know what she looked like. So I said, I'm looking for a girl called Doreen. Then she says, I'm the one. I was pleasantly surprised because she was nice hair and good looking, very beautiful. Then I, I, I went straight into, you come highly recommended by my friend, my best friend. I only have less than six months to find a woman to marry. And you come highly recommended. She burst out laughing. So that's how I broke the ice. We started. I kept uh, on visiting her. Then my father said, are you making progress? Have you found someone? I said, yes. Then I mentioned who it was. He said, oh, I know the father. 
Yeah, the father was my student at Chalimbana. So I went and told him. Then she, she, she says, she questions me. How, come your, how, how old is your father to have taught my father? Then I play, I said, I don't know. You go and ask your father. When she went and asked her father, the father was very happy. She liked, he liked the family. After that, Mwangala, it was nice. <laughs> she was receiving me nicely. So anyway, so I married her quickly and started wearing my wedding band and marketing for business. Then everybody in the parasite world was saying, yes, now you're grown up, we can give you business. At least you're married now. But it all happened very quickly. I started playing golf. I joined Rotary. And um, business happened very quickly. My marketing strategy was very, very strong. And um, within six months, started doing the big jobs. And um, CMM company started off with a two-room office in Findico House. And after six months, we, we did a big job for Zambia State Insurance. Yes, so things happen. We've had a very good run of business, and um, we've been supported very, very well by the uh, clientele. And this is why this year, since we've clocked up 35 years of doing business, we thought we'd do something special to, um, to thank our clients. So we've got some activities like a corporate golf day for the golfers at Bonanza. And then we also have um, a dinner next month for the non-golfers, you know, to, to, to thank them. So we, we've had, the, the, the business has been very, very good. Beautiful. Now let's talk about uh, former, in fact, he's a late president of Zimbabwe. He happens to be your, your godfather. How did you meet? We, we like to call him Uncle Bob. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. Ah. When my father was teaching at Chalimbanda Teachers Training College, um, President Mugabe, then he wasn't a politician, he was a teacher. He came to teach for a contract there. Now, he and my father became best of friends. So when I was born, in 19, 22nd January, 1958. Because Mr. Robert Gabriel Mugabe was my dad's best friend, he stood before me for, he became my godfather for baptism. So my baptism certificate says, for my godfather, Robert Gabriel Mugabe. You know, the as Catholics, Everything is documented from my Holy Communion, Two years. baptism certificate, mm. confirmation. I have all those certificates. I'm a staunch Catholic. So anyway, so was he. So, so after many years, when I graduated, grew up, my father used to tell me, your godfather is Mugabe. Now, he, my father used to work for the Ministry of Education. When when Mugabe in 1980 was being inaugurated as um, the president, the prime minister, head of state of Zimbabwe after the, the liberation struggle, he invited my father. You know, but my father didn't go for that inauguration because he was intimidated to be on the same podium with, with Kenneth Kaunda, with our founding president. So he didn't go. He says, no, comrade, I'm very junior. I'm just an inspector of schools. I can't be on the same podium with with my president, so he declined. But then I told my father, I said, look, I'm, I'm from the private sector. If he ever invites me, I'll go running. <laughs> did he ever invite he you? Did. you? <laughs> he did. He did. What, ha what happened? I went driving. I do. <laughs> what happened is there's an ambassador who came, a Zimbabwean ambassador to Zambia, high commissioner. So I bumped into him at the golf club. So talking to him, I said, oh, by the way, do you know your president is my baptism parent? Then he asked me, he said, have you got proof to that? I said, yes, I've got my baptism certificate. Then he asked me to go and see him the following day. I went to his office. I showed him the, my, the baptism certificate. Then he asked me, he said, have you ever visited him? I said, no. I mean, how do you just go and visit the president? He says, no, no, you have to write to him. 
write to him, and I'll make sure I put your letter in diplomatic bag. He'll receive it, and knowing him, he'll reply to you and invite you. So I wrote a letter, a very simple letter. I just said, dear Godfather, it would surely be a dream come true if I could visit you even only once. Your godson, I signed off. Exactly 10 days, the reply came from, from Zimbabwe, from State House, inviting me to visit him. When the day came, Wangala, I jumped into my Mercedes, sped to Harare, checked into Miko's hotel, called the president's private secretary, and Mr. Matondo, he's retired now. I said, I have an appointment to see the, the president. Then he asked me, who are you? I said, I'm his godson. Hmm. You see, what had happened is he went and told the president. The president said, yes, that's my godson. I want to see him now. <laughs> so Mr. Matondo now says, you, Christopher, you have to get yourself here as quickly as possible. I said, OK, let me just bath quickly. So I bath quickly and put on my best suit, which I'd arranged for the day, jumped into my Mercedes, arrived at State House. They ushered me into, in fact, this yeah. little album was the, the president's press unit. They took pho photos, so that was me signing the visitor's books, they're taking photos, that's me waiting, waiting for him. Then when he came out, you've seen the smile on his face. Oh, yes. He was so happy to see me and I think he saw some features of his late friend, in my dad, you. in me. Mm. So he was so happy. To... Mangala, we spent an hour and a half chatting. He wanted to know what I've done with the family. Now, that was the easiest mm. of, of questions for me to, to tackle. And when, he, when I told him what I've done, I sent my brother to study in England, my nephew in the States, my mother I retired, she didn't have to work anymore since I was successful. He even went and said, so he, he told me, Christopher, you can come to Zimbabwe and do any business you want. Do you understand? Beautiful. Now, what is that one thing that Zambians don't know about you? The one thing that most people don't know is um, who prepared me for business? Really, who prepared me for business? It was my grandmother. My, what had happened is, when I was born, my, 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 grand, my, my maternal grandfather approached my father and requested that I be named after him so that when he, when, when he passes on, I should assume his identity. You know what they say, Okupianika? Mm -hmm. We have that as members. My father obliged, so I was named after my maternal grandfather. Now, when I was eight years old, my grandfather had been farming in, we were living in Chifuvu, that time my parents were away, but he had been farming somewhere in Pongwe. He had uh, some land. So he used to enjoy his drink. So coming from his drinking spree, some people ambushed him and murdered him. I don't know why. So that was a turning point now for me. The rituals now started. They held a big, they bought me brand new clothing. I was eight years old. Oh. And I had to undergo this ceremony. The whole family came for this feast and everybody was now celebrating the coming back of my, my grandfather in me. So now when that happened, everybody was now addressing me as him. Now the significance of what I'm about to tell you is that my grandmother, who was a businesswoman, she used to have a market store in Jefuvo a very successful grocery store. And that's what, where she got the income to look after us when my parents were away. She called it Chipata Grocery because of mm. Chimbuya. Mm. 
And we used to take turns in, in manning the store. My sisters would do it, I would do it with my uncle, we all paired up. And whoever had the highest turnover got rewarded in money form. And we wanted, my uncle and I in our shift, we wanted that. We'd be begging people to buy from the shop. But what happened is, the moment I assumed that role, my grandmother started paying me more attention because now that the husband has come back. Mm. So I was given preferential treatment compared to all the grandchildren because now I was special. So she, she, she would sit me down and tell me, my grandson, I don't want you to grow up and become nobody. I want you to grow up and become somebody. But the most significant thing she told me, my grandson, if you ever want a lot of money to come your way, you must never be stingy with it. You must give it. Then you'll see how money will come to you. And Mangala, over the past 35 years of running this business, I've been generous. Wow. I've been generous. And, and, and money just comes. Sometimes I'll meet somebody on the street. I've only got 100 kwacha in my, my wallet. It's a beggar or a cripple, a blind person. I'll take that 100 kwacha and give it. And you know what they tell me? God bless you. Are you telling me God's blessings are only worth 100 kwacha? Oh. You give? That's too much. Yeah. And fortunate enough, when my, my grandmother, before she died, I told her, I said, Grandmother, all the success I have is because of you. You taught me business. Powerful. If you're on your deathbed and you're given a second chance to live, what would you do differently? I think the most important thing that I nearly missed out on, because I got so busy, as you could imagine, the business grew so fast. One thing anybody should do is make a lot of time for, for your children. I tried the best I could do, bearing in mind how I used to travel internationally, nationally. But my wife always made sure that every holiday, we had to go away somewhere. Family is the most important. And for me, my father told me, it's not only your nuclear family, it's also extended family. And I tried the best I could. Some of, some of my family members, my extended family members, you know, pay school fees for, for material boys, evening on, where they were going. I'd even forgotten about them. Then when we were at the funeral, one of them is drunk. Oh, Vasiem, you remember you paid for my education at Material Boys and uh, evening on when I was doing my accountancy degree, uh, diploma. I'd even forgotten. So that was what my life was characterized like. But now my family members tell me, You've done it. You don't owe anybody. I get emotional. So, so now, what I get to doing is charity work. So the businesses I'm doing now, a substantial amount of it is for charity work. So that's the phase I'm in. Now, as CMM, the company is 35 years old. We've now started expansion out of Zambia. And the first office we're opening up is in Atlanta. And I'm going next month to set it up. Then we'll start the rollout of offices in Africa, South Africa. Botswana, Namibia, Botswana. 
Nigeria, who already plans in setting up there. My friends there, they're waiting for me. Oh. We have to hit that market. It's a big market. In any case, that's where I got my business acumen from. So Those it's time people, to give back. The, wherever we open up an office, whatever business we do there, we, a percentage of the profits are for charity work. And the foundation that I've set up is called the Safeli Motale Mulenga Foundation. It's not in my name. It's not important for me. I honored my father. Wow, that's, that's so powerful. Well, now we know who Mr. Christopher Mulenga is. Obviously, there's so many people that are watching now. What message do you have for them? The message I have for, for Zambians mm. is that we have a beautiful country. We have to develop it. Someone was telling me that since you finish paying all your school fees for your kids and everybody, you don't have anything, why don't you retire? I can't do that. Because now that I have what it takes, the experience, the resources, the ability to set up businesses, that's what Africa needs. That's what Zambia needs. The biggest problem we have in Africa, and Zambia is not an exception, is that there are fewer job prospects. We're churning out more graduates. You, you'd be surprised to know there are some people with master's degrees that can't find a job. So now if a guy like me say, OK, I'm satisfied with what I've done, my investment and so on, I sit back, I'm not adding on to value. I'm not adding value to, to the country. If I set up, continue setting up companies, like I've started doing now, I'm creating jobs. I'm paying tax to the government adding on to the GDP of the country. That's what Zambians have to start thinking about, entrepreneurship. And thank, thankfully, now you don't have to be quizzed the way I was quizzed. You're too young to own a business. Nowadays, even young people who are not married can own a business. Nobody's going to quiz them. We don't have that socialist uh, system anymore. It's capitalist. And fortunate enough, the government is now championing the drive for entrepreneurship. Almost any degree course now, any course, they are adding on subjects of entrepreneurship. Because that's what it's all about. People must be business minded. The government will never create enough jobs to employ anybody. But people must learn to understand that the shortest time possible, if they have the ability, they must set up businesses. When God blesses you with the ability to make money, make good use of that opportunity. Help others. So my message to Zambians, fellow Zambians, that we must help others, especially the underprivileged. And all those people who are successful financially, that money is, is nothing if you don't do charity work if you don't help others with it. There's nothing you're achieving. How many cars can you buy? How many houses can you buy? That's not what it's all about. It's about giving. There's power in giving. That's so powerful. Thank you so much for talking to Ignite with Mwangala. And I hope to have you back again, because I know there's so much that we can learn from you. Thank you very much, Mwangala. So there you have it. When God blesses you with the ability to make the money, make a lot of it and be able to help others. This has been Mwangala Chakalashi Santos. Join me for yet another exciting episode of Ignite with Mwangala.